Hello everybody, this is Danny from Deep South Homestead on Porch Time today. Today I've decided to make the porch chat about the homestead and kind of maybe give you an update on some things that are going on around the homestead. I know y'all seen our tragedy on the homestead video where we had such bad winds here. Then you saw the one come out about blessings on the homestead. Um, God has really been good to us, I'll say that. Today is the last day of the month, tomorrow being June the 1st. As of today, it has been 11 days since we've had rain here. And the temperature has been in the very high 80s to the mid 90s. When it gets like that on our homestead, we have to water every day, morning before the sun comes up. We don't water after the sun comes up. And then the evening, when the sun is almost setting, we'll water again. Simply because if we don't, because of our sandy soil, uh, we'll lose everything we've got. Now over to my left over here is a field on top of a hill that has field corn in it. I went in it yesterday evening. It's about eight feet tall and hasn't even tossed yet, so it's going to be some beautiful corn. There's okra over there, there's sunflowers over there, there's uh, jungle peanuts is planted over there. That hill is at the mercy of God because we just don't have the facility to be able to water that particular hill. Now that particular hill compasses about one acre of land that we plant over there. Now on the other hand, I have a field that's directly behind me back here that is in a swamp bottom that I had cleared several years ago and the water table is extremely high down in there as a matter of fact it's really hard to get it planted early enough in spring but this year we was able to get in there I was able to get the ground broke up and allow it to dry out fast enough that we was able to get our corn planted in there and we have probably a half an acre of corn back here we have some okra back here. We have a few tomatoes and a few pepper plants back here in this particular bottom in here. And it's, a, it's about an acre. We had some potatoes down there. Our fingerling potatoes was in there and they did, they did really, really good because it's kind of moist down in that area. So that one we don't have to worry about because usually no matter how dry it gets, that one usually stays pretty damp down in there so I don't have to worry about that field too much the only thing I have to worry about in that field is getting the crop up before the grass takes over because the ground is just so rich down in there now up here on other parts of our homestead we have raised beds up here raised beds are great they're easy to care for that's one thing I like about them but on my piece of property here and I know it's different everywhere you go the raised beds are, are great for things like strawberries. Now, I know y'all seen the strawberries in my videos if you've looked at them. It, um, it helps us to be able to control the weeds in the strawberries and stuff. We have virtually zero weeds in our strawberries because we put pine straw down underneath them. And our strawberry plants are probably, I don't know, they're up a good 12 inches tall right now. And they're still barren like crazy because we water them every morning. We water them every afternoon but now on the other hand I have some raised beds out here that I have carrots in and tomatoes in I struggle with those beds even though they have everything in it that those plants need I struggle with them because of the extreme heat here they dry out within a few hours and I can't water in the heat of the day because if I do, it'll scald the plants. So we are really at God's mercy even in the raised beds here. And I know we've got mulch down. We have everything we're supposed to have down. But this sandy soil here, the water goes through it just like pouring it through a coffee filter. So that's one thing when you do raised beds on your soil types that you want to kind of keep in mind. Because we've amended our soil. We've done the composting. We've done the, you know, the mulching we've done all that here 
But the soil is so sandy, like I'm telling you, you pour the water in it, it just goes through it just like a coffee filter. Now the mulch does help retain some moisture, but when you've got, like yesterday it was 93 degrees here with 90% humidity, I could water that garden at, I usually water them between 5.30 and 6 o'clock in the morning while the dew is still on. And by 8 o'clock, you, you can't even tell I've watered the ground because the sun and the evaporation is just that intense with this sandy soil. Now, I have a couple of other raised beds right now that I've learned not to, even though they're raised beds, and I know this may sound crazy, but even though they're raised beds, the soil level inside the bed isn't much different than it is outside the bed. Because what I did was I dug the bed down into the ground, because I'm always experimenting here. I dug the bed down into the ground. Actually, I dug about 12 inches of dirt out of the ground, and I re-amended everything and put it back into the bed and brought it up maybe three inches higher than what the ground level on the outside is with good, rich soil. And I have plants planted in those beds. Now those seem to be doing all right. I still water them, but they seem to be doing really, really good. Now we have container gardens, and I was asked a question the other day, why do I do container gardening if I have ground to plant in? Well, the older that you get, the less you're able to get out and work in fields. The less you're able to get out and do row cropping. So the container gardens for me right now is not only is it a way for me to learn, but it's also a way for me to show y'all the different techniques that I'm figuring out for myself because the older I get, um, I'm pretty sure in the future that container gardening will eventually be, and raised beds will eventually be the only way that I'm going to be able to garden because I'm not going to have the help to get out into a field with a hoe and try to hoe, or I'm not going to be able to climb up on a tractor and get out there and, and be able to plow fields and stuff like that. So. I'm going to need to know how to raise things in containers, and I would rather learn it now than have to get to that age and try to learn it then. And, and two, my theory is if I go ahead and set my container gardens up and all my raised beds up and I go ahead and get my irrigation systems established, when that time comes for me in life, I will already have everything in place. All I'll have to do is just turn the water on and water everything. It'd be quite easy to keep the weeds pulled out of everything. Even if I'm in a wheelchair with the container gardening, these pots are about two feet tall, most of them, and I will still be able to get to my pots. Now also, while we're doing all of this, we are at the same time doing permaculture. We're working toward an edible landscape. Now, also another question was brought up on one of my uh, one of my chats about permaculture and row cropping. If you're looking for a fast return, row cropping is going to be the way that you're going to want to do it. But if you're looking for long-term sustainability and with little effort and little work, then permaculture is going to be the way that you're going to want to get yourself started. Now, we're doing row cropping still. We're doing container gardening. We're doing raised beds. And at the same time, we are doing permaculture in the midst of all of this. Because as time goes on, permaculture will eventually catch up with these other forms of gardening. It's just that permaculture is not an instant gratification. Permaculture is a process in which things have to go through. And once you have it established, then 
is when it pays off. Now, it doesn't take place in one year or two years or three years. It's usually, uh, my understanding is it's about five years plus. And actually, the longer it goes on, the better it is. There again, being in the area in which I live, there's always that imminent threat of a hurricane coming in and blowing down everything. I've had it to happen to me in two different occasions. Uh, I've, I got hit by a tornado here, uh, I think it was 2011, a tornado come right through my property, come right over top of my house here. It, uh, it blew down timber all around my house, uh, broke all my trees off, uprooted some two and three feet diameter trees here and just threw them on the ground like they were toothpicks. And thank God my house only lost one shingle off my house. I was really, really blessed in that. And I want to praise God for that. But that's my point. Even with permaculture, you know, there's no guarantees. Because at that particular point, if I'd have been way into permaculture, it would have been a, th it would have been a point where I just had to start all over again. Because that tornado tore down... I don't remember. I want to say it was somewhere around 50 trees here around my house and in my fields and everything. And just, I had holes in the ground you could put pickup trucks in where these big trees, you know, came up out of the ground. But, you know, but you have to still keep going. That That's the whole concept behind all this. You don't ever stop and you don't ever give up. You keep pushing forward, trying to reach that goal or reach that mark. Because should a life-changing event take place, you want to be able to have permaculture started on your homestead. Because there are a lot of people out here that are preppers. And, and I really get that because they don't have the means in which they can grow a lot of stuff. And I'm... And I'm and I'm all behind you on that. If that's the way you have to go, then then bless God, go for it. That's the way I look at it. Um, give it all you've got. Dump as much money into it as you can right now. Because just like um, I saw the question mentioned last, uh, it was a couple of days ago, was it Sunday night? I was watching um, Tommy with Off Grid Nation had a live call-in show, and I was watching that. And someone asked the comment, did the, did the economy in Venezuela collapse? And yes, it did. Um, and the thing about that is, there's nothing to say that that won't happen here. And if it does, then there's not going to be any going to the store buying anything. Because it, you just go up, just Google. All you got to do right now is just Google. Of Venezuela and what's going on down there and you'll see people standing in lines everywhere just trying to get something to eat just a small amount the grocery store shelves are empty people are starving there is no finances there is no pharmaceuticals hardly I mean there is virtually little of anything going on in Venezuela right now. I know America's getting blamed for it. I know that. And, and it's quite possible we may even play a part in it. I'm not sure because I don't watch the news. I don't I don't even turn the TV on if I don't have to. Most of my information comes from reliable sources and friends that I have that's all over different places of the world um, that tells me what's going on where they live at. And I'm I'm really, really troubled by a lot of things I see but at the same time on a homestead that's the whole point I'm trying to make with everybody is please do what you can do on your homestead you know if you have to container garden then do it if you have to do raised beds then do it if you have the land and the means to row crop then do it store food get food any way you can i know that i did the law of threes and food is the third one on the list but to be perfectly honest with you you do have to have it to survive but at the same time our homestead right here we have uh we actually have three water sources i have a live stream that runs out of the ground i have a i have a well that i've dug that i can get water out of by hand 
and I have an electric pump. And as long as I have electricity, I can get water where the electric pump is. If the electrical grid goes down, I've still got my other well to get water out of. And if worse comes to worse, I do have a, a stream that I can get water out of to take a bath with, I can to wash my clothes with, or whatever. I mean, we, we do have those water sources here on the homestead. And that's, that's what it will take to survive. But also on our homestead here, we have hugel culture going on. This is something that I have experimented with here in the Deep South. I know it's predominantly something that's done in the northern climates, especially in Germany where it was originated from. They have a cooler climate than they do here. But I have done some extensive study with, with um, hugel culture. My hugel culture bed is about 150 feet long and it's some three feet deep in the ground and probably five feet wide and three feet high. It works for some things, it doesn't work for some things. And that's the whole point of what I'm doing right now is I'm on a journey trying to figure out what works in the deep south on hugel culture. Now there's going to be a video coming out here pretty soon about that. Uh, about the hugel culture bed and let you see some of the things we have growing on it. And I have, I have lost a lot of things on it, but I've also made a lot of things on it. So it lets me know what will work and what won't work on, on a hugel bed. The only thing that we have fruit-wise that's really doing anything, what I'd call decent, is the blueberries. Now the blueberries are maxing. They are really, really producing big time. Oh, our spaghetti squash, um, I'm sitting here looking at them across the hill right over here on the vines out here. It's, it's, uh, it's about 90 degrees right now. The vines are laying flat on the ground. They're just wilted down completely flat. You just see squash laying on the ground. Uh, from here, they're probably not going to make it. Um, you know, in the evening times at night, they'll perk back up a little bit, but they're, you can tell they're just not doing what they need to do. This year, the tomatoes, we've had a new insect hit our tomatoes. It's a little worm. I, I'm not familiar with it. He's about a half an inch long. He's uh, green with... Uh, dark brown stripes lengthwise up and down his body there uh, one plant yesterday I got 75 right at 75 worms off of one plant and they hit at night and hatch out the next day they don't ever get any bigger than that um, it's a worm I've never seen here before I've never experienced this problem I've got to start looking into it because I actually found three plants out of my, I've got over a hundred tomato plants set out and three of them, I got 50 plus worms off of each plant. And it looked like somebody backed off with a shotgun and shot the leaves on the plant. And that was what made me notice them being there because I walk my plants every day. So that's, you know, that's some other things that's happening here on the homestead. I mean. God is still good. We've still got a lot of good stuff. Um, we're not downing anything because everything is, is doing pretty fair. We're harvesting squash. We're beginning to can squash. Uh, even in this extreme heat, it's still, it still seems to be pulling out. Now the leaves wilt down during the day, but they perk back up at night. So we're, we're, we're happy about that. Um, cucumbers are doing fair. They need a lot of water. The ones we can get water to are doing okay, but the ones that we can't get water to, they're not producing anything hardly. Snap beans, I've had to just quit picking them because it just got the heat's got too bad. Um, and rather than run the risk of losing my seeds, we've decided to let everything in the field just go right now and go to seed, and we'll harvest them and take the loss on the green beans this year. I think we're going to be down about 30 jars. The sweet corn that you saw in the tragedy. Only time will tell whether it'll make an ear of corn or not because I walked up and looked at it on a daily basis and even though the corn is curled and, and has come back up, it had tousled whenever it blowed down. Uh, I'm not sure if the length of time it took it to pull back up, which is a little over a week, if the pollen had already fallen off the tousles and it, if it, I don't know if it reached the corn or not. We'll have to wait and see on that. 
I do know that if we don't get some water, that uh, the little old ears won't be but about that big around, maybe that long. You know, what I mean, I, I do, I know that already. But other than that, I, that's the, I'm sorry, that's what's going on in our homestead. I just thought I'd share that with y'all today, and um, just I pray that y'all's homesteads are going well. I know I've, I've I, live, I watch a lot of y'all's channels and. I know some of y'all are still having some cool weather, and God bless you for that. You know, because <laughs> we haven't had any in so long. I don't even I don't even remember the last day we had any cool weather here. But it is a it's a blessing when I can look and see people are still having some cool weather. That that encourages me that at least they're still hanging in there and still have hope of getting some things in the ground. Right now, I'd be a fool to plant anything here hardly because it, it's not going to make it. Um, so, I guess that's my chat for today. Thank y'all for watching from Deep South Homestead.